Welcome to Health Law 101. All right. I'm going to put the agenda up on the screen here, first of all, while I go through our quick announcements. There aren't too many. So first, our next webinar on November 8th will be about HIPAA. And so uh, Katie Ilton, uh, Briar Andreessen, and Margie Amon are going to be talking about HIPAA issues, breach, and the like. So that's November 8th. December 13th, we'll be talking about new things, the new physician fee schedule, the new outpatient prospective payment rule, and the like. I think the only other announcements, you can ask questions by typing them in the chat box. And if you like this thing after we get our technical issues, issues fixed, you can listen to it. It'll be uploaded next week. All of our past webinars are on the website, and you can listen to them anytime for free. So go to the website. You can go through those. So here's what we're going to talk about, starting off with a bit of perspective on health law. And we have an interesting mix. We've got, all, I think this is our biggest webinar ever. We're over 600 signups. I think we're around 700. Um, and we have a mix. We've got people who are lawyers who've been lawyers for a long time and people who are brand new. So this is set up to cover some of the basics. So if you're more advanced, I apologize in advance, but that's, that's how we build it. A lot of life is perspective. If you look at the arrow here, this is a picture from Cassini, and that's Earth, right? Where you are and where you sit can affect how you look at things. And that's certainly true in the healthcare world. One of the big questions is there's a lot of conflicting advice out there about the healthcare stuff. Who do you believe? And my answer to that may surprise you. I'm going to take a line which might be from the X Files. I never watched the show. But I think that they used to say, trust no one. Um, you know, we could go back, and, and I was talking about Vietnam earlier, we could go back and say, trust no one under 40. Um, over 40. Trust no one over 40, which would take me out. So don't trust me. And that actually, don't trust me, is something that I actually would say. I don't think you should trust anyone in the healthcare world. It's too hard to get things right. So who do you believe? No one. You've got to always question it. whether you're talking to a lawyer or a consultant or an internal person. Make us all back up what we're saying. Things change. I regularly discover that a rule I relied on isn't true anymore. I was giving a talk recently with someone from the OIG, and I was mentioning an, a letter that Janet Rehnquist wrote in 2001 that I used to say, hey, if you find an error rate on an internal review, of 5% or less, you definitely don't need to project to a larger universe because that's what the OIG said, writing a letter to people who had a CIA. That letter's still on the website, but the OIG doesn't consider it operative. Now, you couldn't find that. You can't Google it and find that. The only reason I know it is I was lucky enough to give a talk with a good lawyer from the OIG, and she told me, oh, we don't consider that valid anymore, but they've left it up. There's a lesson there, right? You can find things on the internet, you can talk to your lawyer, and what you're getting might be wrong or outdated. So what do you do? Ask questions and make them, make people explain things. If there's only one message you get out of today's webinar, it would be always have some doubt. Um, don't think that just because you've heard something for years and years and years, it's still true, or that the second piece of information in is wrong. I've said many times, I give undue credence to the first piece of information I get, there's no reason to think the first piece is better than the second. Obviously, there are more laws than we can cover in an hour. That's a given. There are a bunch of policy questions that run through health law. I don't know the future. Uh, reimbursement is constantly changing. I am incapable of predicting whether we're going to wind up with a fee-for-service system or some value-based system or bundled payments or what. My hunches will be moving towards bundled payments, but I don't know. I do know that the word fraud is used to silence debate a lot. And that bothers me because all kinds of mistakes happen and they are not fraud, but people like to label things as fraud because it gets an immediate response. And then I will say this more than once, never forget about state law because it's out there, it's, it's a challenge. So we'll, we'll come back to that a few times. If you want to understand health law on a macro level, I think that there are sort of four key questions to ask. So first, there are a bunch of laws that affect relationships. That's maybe the main area of health law stuff, the anti-kickback statute, antitrust. It's stark. Those are all about financial relationships between one participant in the healthcare industry and someone else. So that's sort of one body of law. 
Then there's another body of law that deals with how you bill things, all right? And I suppose I'm leaving out here in today's summary things like there's FDA and you know, sort of quality stuff. That's sort of a different world, and I, we aren't going to try to cover that today. Whenever you're talking about the law, I think it's helpful to ask yourself, are you asking the question, can we do something? Or is this something that's reimbursable? And I'm sometimes not careful in my word choice, right? We'll talk about a billing rule, and I will say, you can do that. Well, you can do that is a terrible way to frame that. You can bill for that is a more accurate way to frame it. Because there are all kinds of things you can do and do for free. And so you always want to understand whether the prohibition is on the activity or billing for the activity. And if your lawyer doesn't explain that, push them on it. And then finally, it's always good to think about whose rule it is. There was a, a great question I'm going to be talking about on Monitor Monday next week from someone who said, hey, I've just got something from Humana. They say it's not a Humana rule, it's a Medicare rule. Well, when you've got a situation like that, private payers don't automatically get to rely on Medicare answers. Every private payer sets its own rules. It's, it's a challenge for you. It's a challenge for us. Medicare and Medicaid are different. Um, you can contractually agree to something that's different from what Medicare and Medicaid do. So you have to know whose rule it is, and you have to recognize the bizarre reality, which is you may need to discriminate and treat people differently. People often think you can't treat t people differently. In healthcare, you often need to treat them differently because perhaps your, um, your private payer is saying, we won't cover preventive services, and Medicare will cover them in certain situations. So that is confusing, but it's the reality in which we live. And so I will sometimes just say, you can't do this, and I'm thinking about Medicare, another dangerous mistake to make. When you're talking about Medicare, at least there's a clear legal hierarchy. You've got the Constitution at the tippy top, then statutes, which are laws, regulations, which are things you find in the Federal Register, preamble, which is a fancy term for the language that appears in the Federal Register but isn't actually a regulation. You can think of it as the government's explanation of why they're doing something in a regulation. National coverage decisions, then manuals, local coverage decisions, and then carrier guidance. Anything below NCD that you see there is a lot less binding. So if, the, if a contractor comes out with an LCD, we were just looking at an LCD for a client in Florida, and that LCD is not binding, right? If you, you can choose to disregard it, you do not have an overpayment just because you're not in compliance with an LCD. You might get into a fight about it, and there's no guarantee you'll win that fight, but it is not binding. It is relatively common when something new comes out that's a new proposed rule. People will talk about it, and they'll get all, gung they'll get all excited. Proposed rules are, I was almost gonna, I was going to say they are irrelevant. That isn't true. Obviously, you want to know what they are, but they are not binding, and it's really important to distinguish between things that are proposed and things that are final. When some proposed outpatient rules came out a little while ago, all kinds of consultants were saying this is on provider-based stuff you better change the way you deliver services because of these proposed rules. And I would say you never want to change anything based on a proposed rule because many a proposed rule has not be been finalized. When we talk about laws, they're not all laws are criminal, all right? Some are, some aren't. Many are counterintuitive, and I think that's what keeps us health lawyer types gainfully employed. And then did I mention state law? So I'm going to keep coming back to state law because it's really hard. It's often very difficult to find. So let me tell you two quick stories. In one, I'm the hero. In one, I'm the, shall we say, the goat. Uh, this is just as an aside. We've got goats in my neighborhood eating the uh, buckthorn. This is like across the street from my house where we literally have goats that are hired. And so you see goat working signs. Okay, so the story in which I'm a hero occurred in Texas. And a client called me. They were a physician, and they had been thrown off the staff because they opened up an ASC, and the hospital said, we, in our bylaws, say that if you compete with us, we're throwing you off the staff. It's often called economic credentialing. Well, I did a little bit of research and found a Texas law that forbid hospitals from engaging in economic credentialing. And I was, you know, there were a bunch of other lawyers, all from Texas, who were in, and none of them knew about this law. And so I'm the hero, right? Unfortunately, I can't brag too much about this, because let me tell you another story where I'm the goat. 
That was when it was in Minnesota, and we were working on something, and counsel from another state called me up and pointed out a law in Minnesota that I had been completely oblivious to. I practiced here, uh, you know, now it's been 25 years. At that point, it was probably 20, and I had never heard of that statute. State laws can be really hard to find. They're often buried in places, and so even when you know what the federal law is on something, that doesn't mean you know what the state law is. So let's talk for a moment reimbursement 101. This is just a quick overview on some key terms. So the Medicare program has parts. Part A, it covers things like hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, hospice and the like. It generally is paid to things that are labeled as providers. And the definition of provider here, you can think of it operationally, it's usually a facility, but I would say it's things paid under Part A. Part B is what you think of like for a Medicare, for a physician office is paid under Part B. Um, you know, outpatient physical therapy, uh, outpatient imaging, an independent diagnostic testing facility. Those are paid under Part B. Medicare refers to those as suppliers. And I think it's helpful to try to choose your words carefully. It's often easy if you're talking about physicians and nurse practitioners and the like, you might talk about those professionals as providers. I really try to avoid doing that and instead refer to them as professionals or medical professionals or something like that and use the term providers for buildings like hospitals and SNFs. When you're thinking about reimbursement, it's helpful to think about whether something is being paid on a fee-for-service basis, a prospective payment. So clinics, and Medicare pays doctors on a fee-for-service basis. Hospitals, when you get a DRG, that's a prospective payment where there's a bundle that's determined based on a diagnosis. And then there are some other mechanisms for paying things. And it's other terms that come up a lot. There's a professional reimbursement. That's what's paid to the medical professional. The technical component. So in imaging, you've got a read done by the radiologist. And then a technical piece for the actual taking of the film. And then you can have facility fees. Like in an ambulatory surgical center, the center gets paid a facility fee. You know, there's graduate medical education. So you have to think about all of these different payments it can get really complicated. One of the first False Claims Act cases I worked on was a situation where a teaching facility and the doctor both billed for the same services. And the argument was that there was duplication and double billing, which seems like a deadweight loser. We were able to, prevent, to convince the government that if you followed the instruction given to the hospital and you followed the instruction given to the doctor, and those were different, part A and part B, each had a reason to think it could bill. And we convinced the government to dismiss that case because of the of following the separate instructions through to the end. So sometimes you can get really crazy results. So if you had a theme song that you were going to play about health policy, what would it be? And I'm a big fan of Kermit the Frog, but my song is not um, Someday We'll Find It, The Rainbow Connection, even though that was a really pretty rainbow last week out of my office. I'd go with the Spice Girls. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. In the... I don't go with the Spice Girls very often, but the reason I go with them here is that we do not know what policies we're advocating. On the one hand, we want integration, right? Get everyone together. Multiple MRIs on every corner are expensive. On the other hand, um, we want competition. Those two things are opposites, right? Some states have certificate of need, CON, that says you need to get approval to put in a new a new facility or, uh, um, you know, whether it be an ASC or imaging or something like that, a new hospital. That's completely contrary to the idea that competition lowers price. Some of that, if you think of it on a policy level, stems from the fact that doctors are the gatekeepers to health care and there's the idea in health economics of supplier-induced demand, the idea that a doctor can decide whether you need something or not. We don't know yet which we want, and that inconsistency creates regulatory headaches. All right? We don't know which way we're coming down on that. So let's talk for a moment about a substantive law. We'll do the False Claims Act. All right? So I'm going to do this pretty quickly. Hopefully everyone knows it's a Civil War era statute that got updated to deal with defense contractor fraud. They upped the penalties recently so that if you now have a jury verdict in a False Claims Act case, the minimum penalty is almost $11,000 a claim. Um, and a maximum penalty of almost $22,000 a claim. A giant sum. Most states have laws. Now, not every mistake is a False Claims Act thing. Um, you know, if you make a dating mistake, everyone who ever dated me was making a dating mistake. Uh, if you make a dating mistake, 
the one isn't a false claim. Now, if you do it all the time, like if you just pay no attention at all to getting your dates right, that's probably a false claims issue or potentially it's reckless disregard. But otherwise, not every mistake is. And we know this because Eric Holder said that. Let me make this very clear. The False Claims Act does not address, and we should never use it to pursue, honest billing mistakes or mere inadvertence. That quote notwithstanding, the government often does label things you or I would consider to be a mistake as fraud. It's a frustration of mine. But use quotes like this and other things to push back and say, you get to make mistakes. False Claims Act penalties shouldn't apply there. So the Quitam statute allows private people to file suit in the name of the government. And when they do so, they can get between 15 and 30 percent of whatever the government obtains. So um, most people know about this. You may have seen me use this cartoon. Well, that is the downside, Fluffy. When we kill her, the pampering will end. Um, you know, you could have, whether it's disgruntled employees, competitors, patients, someone who's out there who says, hey, this is a chance for me to get a bunch of money. Um, when it happens, these cases move at a snail's pace often. The suit may be filed for conceivably two or three years before you discover it exists. And sometimes now we even find out about a case when the government declines to, to get involved. They've done their investigation and you are completely in the dark until they make a decision. So one question we get asked a lot is, can you ask employees to promise not to file a quitam suit? And the answer to that is, you must be as tall as this sign to attack this city. That sign's not going to keep Godzilla out of Tokyo, and I would not ask employees to sign that. First, it's probably not enforceable, almost certainly not, because the right to bring an action is actually vested in the government, and so a employee can't waive the government's right to bring a suit, so they don't have the ability to sign away that right. And just more to the practically speaking, who wants to be asking their employees to promise not to report concerns? I hope you're asking your employees on at least an annual basis and arguably a quarterly basis to certify in writing any compliance concerns they have. We have a little form we can send you. If you want it, shoot me an email. I'll send it to you. Um, it's very simple, and it lets employees list all of their concerns. The benefit of using this form is that you will find out what people are worried about. The disadvantage of using this form is you will get inundated with things. Um, but the other benefit, there's one more benefit, which is when someone complains that they have brought an issue up for the last four years and been ignored, you can show them four years worth of forms, ideally like 16 forms, where they didn't report this concern and demonstrate that, in fact, this hasn't been an issue you've been talking about for a long time. In life, there's constantly a tension between secrecy and openness. I really like the idea of openness, recognizing that there are times it can't work, right? I mean, if your client calls me, I can't blab about everything they tell me. But I think openness makes people feel more comfortable. So in the compliance world, if someone raises a question, I'm a fan of letting them know what the answer is, right? I, if they say, I think this doctor is committing fraud, there's some people will say we can't give them the answer because of HR issues. And I get that. And there are times you worry about defamation. But ultimately, I want them to understand that what the answer to their question was. Um, if you want more, we just did a compliance plan webinar last month. There's a whole topic about that. So you can, you know, if you can't find it on our website, it should be easy. Send me an email. But if you just look at the, uh, the website on webinars, it's right there. So the principles under the FCA are pretty basic. There's a case last summer, the Escobar case, which changed the world a little bit. In the old days, you used to hear us talk about conditions of payment, which were things that would basically say you don't get paid unless you do this and you'd only have an overpayment if you violated conditions of payment and you compare that to conditions of participation which were things you need in order to be enrolled in medicare and so for example if a hospital chart isn't signed that's a violation of the conditions of participation and in the old days we would say that's not an overpayment now the focus according to the supreme court is on materiality so they ask a very simple question if the government had known about this thing would they have paid the claim? And the Supreme Court was really clear that not every violation of the law creates an overpayment. That is crystal, crystal clear. Let me say that again. You can violate the law and not have an overpayment, right? So for example, an unsigned chart does not create an overpayment, let alone a false claim, okay? 
On to a different topic. Whether it be for false claims or something else, one of the decisions you often have to make is how to engage counsel. And as a counsel, I've got a few thoughts on this. First, an observation. I've seen lawyers brag about how they were involved in the five biggest settlements in the country. And it can be really easy to give that person then a lot of credence, right? Wow, they've been in all of these big cases. Who would you rather hire? The person who is involved in the five biggest settlements in the country or someone who's worked on three cases and gotten them all to go away? And I'd posit you want the latter. Um, and in fact, you can get a lot of these False Claims Act cases to go away. So be careful when someone is bragging about their expertise that they're saying something useful. Um, does geography matter? I know people often worry, well, can we use you, David? You're not in our state. And so first, let me just, this will be my only naked pitch in this, in this talk. We would love to work for you. So yes, we can work for you. We would love to. Now, moving on to the reality of this, right? Does geography matter? Well, you heard my goat hero story, right? I was the goat in Minnesota, and I was the hero in Texas. There are licensure things that matter for some situations, but like in litigation, you can um, get yourself admitted on a pro hoc vice uh, basis to get in for a case. You can get yourself admitted for a, in a variety of other ways, or you can work with local counsel. It's always possible to overcome any licensure issues that exist. And for many things, licensure isn't really that big an idea. For many of the problems that come up, you're dealing with federal law um, or you're dealing with questions. So geography matters more for proximity, and there it doesn't even matter. I was working with a client in Missouri, and I learned an important lesson. Phone interviews can be really effective in some situations. They aren't, don't work if you have to do a lot of paper, but in other situations, they can work really well. So does the firm's name matter? I'm biased on this one. I personally don't think so, but I know some people will think so. But I would say a long history doesn't make someone right. Does the hourly rate matter? That's, I think, a thing that matters almost the least. You want to know how much something is going to cost, and you can have two people. Um, I have what I think of as a rather high hourly rate. You know, my hourly rate's like 600 bucks an hour. Um, it's low compared to New York lawyers. I mean, I've been staffing cases where someone was literally three times my rate. But it ain't cheap, right? I would find myself expensive. Um, but I had a project recently where I was working on something, and another lawyer was working on it. it had a $400 an hour letter uh, rate. We both wrote, wrote letters. Actually, I wrote an email. My total bill was 750 bucks. Her total bill was 10000 The hourly rate is irrelevant. Ask how much the thing is going to cost. Um, clients often worry about conflicts. And I've had people say, oh, you work you know, with other radiology clients. We don't want to work with you because we want our people to be only working with us. And I get that instinct, but I would encourage people to rethink it. You do not want a lawyer who, only, who you know, if, you're, if they're only working with you in this specialty, they're not going to know the nuance, right? You don't want me writing your will. Um, you don't want me helping you with your tax questions. Actually, you don't even really want me helping you with your HIPAA questions. You'd want to use Katie Ilton or Breyer Andreessen. The world is too complicated. So you want someone who works with your competitors, I would argue, because you want someone who knows this stuff. And then finally, ask around a lot because hiring the wrong lawyer matters. All right, another general point. This comes up a lot. Um, David, we've discovered someone is doing something illegal. Do we need to report, right? It's perhaps one of the most common questions. Well, the if you see something, say something doesn't always, it applies great in the compliance context. It doesn't apply in your legal duties. So you do not have a general legal duty to report law violations, all right? Um, if you see a bank robbery, you are not required to call 911. Internally, I hope every organization expects people to say, if, I, if you're aware of something that might be a problem, not that actually is a problem, but that might be a problem, you'll report it. And I think every organization should have an internal reporting duty. The reporting duty to the government is pretty much limited other than license. So this is a great example, right? I'm about to talk about a Medicare provision, but there can be other things. If you're a licensed healthcare professional, your licensing board probably has some reporting duty. But in the Medicare reimbursement context, the main reporting duty comes from the 60-day rule. And the 60-day rule, which is part of the Affordable Care Act, says that if you know of an overpayment, you have a duty to refund the money within 60 days of identifying the overpayment. 
Now, regulations came out that changed the no to a should have known. And so they would now say, if you knew or should have known of an overpayment, you have to return it within 60 days of identification. In case anyone is unaware of this, identification includes quantification. So the 60 days doesn't run the minute someone says, I think we have a problem, Houston. It runs after Houston has quantified the size of the problem. And then the government says you generally get about six months to figure out whether that problem is real or not. If you're under that, you're probably okay. If you're over that, you better have a good story to tell. Um, so you are not obligated. If you think your person across the street is committing fraud, unless there's a licensing board duty to report, you generally don't have to pick up the phone and turn them in. You may choose to. Let's move to a, some, the substantive area of the law. And this is, if we go back to the part we're thinking about, this is the relationships part of the talk. And I'm going to go quickly through the anti-kickback statute and Stark. So let's start with the anti-kickback statute, which I would argue is the easiest of the statutes that we're going to talk about to understand. It actually makes sense. So it's a felony if anyone gives or asks for, um, accepts, or give, uh, let's see, I missed one in there. So I guess ask uh, any payment that's intended to influence referrals under a federal health care program. And when this, operationalizing this, the government uses the one purpose test. They'll say if there are a bunch of reasons why you are doing a deal, but one of the reasons is to pay for referrals, it's illegal. Um, that one purpose test becomes a big deal because it, 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 it means that all of the good reasons in the world won't save a bad deal, all right? So there's really one question, why? And so an anti-kickback discussion is usually not involving a lot of research. It's usually a 15-minute phone call of why. So real-world operation, how, how does this work? So if someone says, I want you to come listen to me, you know, a drug rep comes in and says, come in, I want you to hear my spiel, here's pizza to listen to the spiel. There's a pretty good argument that that is not a payment for a referral. It's a payment to listen. And so I don't, I, I think there are all kinds of reasons people may ethically not want to let people bring food into the clinic, right? Or the hospital. That's fine. And I'm totally zen with that. But I don't think it's a felony. But if someone is saying, I'm giving this to you so you will order this service, well, that's when you're going to prison, right? Or potentially. Now, we, the, the gang here, think that a kickback requires three parties. And I would even argue that it arguably requires deception. Um, and what I mean by that, if, you, if I'm buying your house, I offer a price, and then or you're, you're asking for $100,000 and I offer you eighty. dollars That's a discount, right? That's just a discount? We can do that deal. Um, that's totally okay. A kickback requires a deceived insurer. Um, and so if you are working with an uninsured patient, I think it's really hard to have a kickback. I think a kickback gets introduced only when you are giving some discount to a purchaser and a health insurer um, doesn't know about it. Uh, Okay, so in the anti-kickback world, there are a bunch of safe harbors. Those safe harbors are insanely narrow. Real-world example, the safe harbor for ASCs says that if you do a joint venture between a physician and a hospital, in order to fit the safe harbor, you can't put the joint venture in a place where the hospital is in a position to refer, and that means it can't be in the hospital's service area you are never, ever going to see an ASC that is put outside the hospital's service area. Not going to happen, right? So you know you're not going to be in these safe harbors. You don't need to be in these safe harbors. It isn't a requirement. It isn't an expectation. So really, the anti-kickback law is about common sense. Now, different lawyers can approach this very differently. I was working with a big national health law firm on something. We were asked the same question, and their advice was, hey, we didn't find an advisory opinion saying this was okay, suggesting the activity was illegal. I would never draw that. I don't, actually, I don't think any good health lawyer would draw that conclusion. The absent silence does not suggest illegality, all right? 
You got to understand how your health lawyer looks at things. Are they conservative or aggressive? There isn't even a right or wrong there. And I don't think it's wrong to hire a lawyer that has a different risk tolerance than you. You just need to understand their risk tolerance and adapt, right? I will, there are things that will keep me awake at night that I would not do. And I have clients that do, and I'm okay with that. I will tell them I wouldn't do this. You're the boss. You get to choose. There are things I would feel very comfortable with. Um, signed charts would be an example. Like I would bill for a chart that was missing a signature, right? I'd probably ask the doctor to sign it and date it correctly, but it wouldn't freak me out. But I have had clients say, well, we're going to choose not to bill. They can do that. It's a different course than I would choose. And I think our job as lawyers is to tell you, here's the law. Here's the government's enforcement position. What are you comfortable with? So the kinds of things that are going to get people in trouble under the anti-kickback statute, you know, the classic one was a case uh, um, involving Baptist Medical Center in Kansas early on. The LaHue brothers were two medical directors. The hospital paid them $60,000 to be a medical director. They didn't expect them to show up at meetings, or, or maybe they did expect them to, but when they failed to show up at meetings, no one gave them a hard time. No work was really done. And that became a criminal case where the doctors and hospital staff and even the lawyer who wrote the deal all got indicted okay so that's a big potential problem a doctor walks into two hospitals and says if you don't give us what we want we'll take our business to the other hospital that's the kind of stuff that makes me super duper nervous but let's change that to a doctor walks in and says you know your hospital's turnaround time is abysmal if you don't improve the turnaround time we're taking our cases somewhere else i think that's different and if I had to explain why, I guess I would say I don't think that turnaround time is remuneration to the doctor. I think it's an efficiency thing. And it can be a little tough to fully articulate this, but in my mind and in the minds of all of the people I, whose opinions I respect, that's very different from saying um, if you don't you know, subsidize our outreach and pay us you know, $30,000, we're taking our cases elsewhere. So advisory opinions are a thing you can get. We don't generally get them. You know, we've helped people do them, but it's usually not worth the trouble. Usually you can come to your own conclusion. I recommend an advisory opinion only in situations where you really want to do something. We think it's really risky and you won't do it absent an advisory opinion. The Stark Law. The anti-kickback law is straightforward and you can explain it relatively easily. Stark is not straightforward it's really weak i could put you to sleep easily talking stark i'll try not to and explain it as clearly as i can so first it only applies to designated health services so that's dhs um, and the next slide will list them all right everything a hospital does is a designated health service so you always need to worry about stark when you have relationships between doctors and hospitals if any money is flowing from a physician and Stark only applies to physicians. It doesn't apply to PAs. It doesn't apply to clinical nurse specialists, nurses, physical therapists. It applies to doctors. And, there, well, actually, when I say it doesn't apply to physical therapists, that's a little complicated because physical therapy is an entity for, of DHS. But it applies to a relationship between a doctor and an entity that provides one of these services on the next slide. Okay, so if a doctor is getting money from or paying money to someone who does one of these things, Stark applies. And, you know, it's not a criminal law. No one goes to jail for violating Stark. You pay $15,000 a claim. And because it's not a criminal law, it isn't intent-based. Basically, if there's compensation between a doctor and an entity providing one of these services, you need to meet one of Stark's exceptions, all right? There's no close. It's not like the safe harbors. The safe harbors you don't have to meet. And that's why people often conflate Stark and the anti-kickback statute. They're really different. So Stark is just more challenging. It's a lot harder to do. Um, I will often refuse to give Stark advice on an initial phone call. I want to hang up and think about it because it's a little harder. But the big first question, are there designated health services? One of the things from the prior slide. And are they provided by someone that has some sort of financial relationship with a doctor? If yes, we've got a problem. Now, the financial relationship doesn't have to have anything to do with health care. In fact, and I, I didn't say this very clearly, it's a relationship with the doctor or any member of the doctor's immediate family. So 
you know, the doctor's got a 17-year-old kid who's got a lawn mowing business. You know, she's been mowing lawns and tending to gardens. Well, that's a relationship with the physician's immediate family member. That relationship has to meet a Stark exception. It can. If the pain, you know, there are a bunch it could fit. It could be a, a meet the fair market value exception or the personal services exception. So it's not that you can't pay the doctor's kid to mow lawns. It's just you're going to have to have a written agreement. It's going to have to be at fair market value. And someone has to be thinking about that. One of the craziest things about Stark is that referral isn't used in the way any normal person would use it. If a doctor says to a patient, you need a scan, go out and get a scan, the doctor has referred the patient to wherever the patient goes to get the scan done. And that's crazy, but it's how things are set up. Um, and so it, the doctor might think, think, well, I didn't name the scanning company that I'm the owner in, so it's okay. And that seems rational. It's just wrong. So um, creating the plan of care is what constitutes the referral. And then the entity in question is either the place that bills for it or whoever is providing the service. And so you get into this weird world. Um, if, if you've got services that are being provided under arrangements, like an outside vendor is coming into a hospital, say a physical therapy vendor provides the services on sort of a turnkey basis to the hospital, oddly, there are two entities, the hospital and the physical therapy vendor. And so if the doctor had a relationship with either of those two, Stark could be implicated. Um, there's a rural exception. If you're outside of a metropolitan statistical area, ownership, and only ownership, not compensation, is protected. Um, it, you know, and you have to, it, rural area means outside of a metropolitan statistical area and 75% of the patients are there. Something to note, MSAs grow and change. When we started giving advice, Mankato in Minnesota, which you might know from Little House on the Prairie fame, was rural. Uh, that change it became urban and that can happen and you got to pay attention to that um the rural exception only protects ownership and not compensation and i don't want to get too bogged down in stark so i'm just going to kind of cover a few things kind of flag them if you've got a per a per compens a per click so payment to a doctor for something that the doctor is ordering that's generally going to be a bigger concern so if the doctor owns a scanner and leases it to the hospital and the doctor is ordering scans, that's likely problematic, at least if there's Medicare and Medicaid involved, right? Um, if, the, if you convert the lease into a flat fee per month and make it fair market value, that same deal might work, okay? Um, big picture, in rural areas, things are going to be a lot easier. In urban areas, some joint ventures can work, and that's a topic for a whole nother webcast. We did a webinar on physician compensation. I think that there are a bunch of red herrings on physician compensation, including massive misuse of salary surveys. People will often say any compensation above the 60th percentile is unreasonable. I personally think that's a bunch of hogwash. You can watch that whole webinar here. Within the comp formula, Stark limits how doctors can divide money in the group. It only applies to Medicare and Medicaid revenue and doctors can't get paid for designated health services they order. While it only applies to Medicare and Medicaid revenue, I worry so much about mistakes. I personally, this is in the what's legal versus risk tolerance. If I were a doctor, I don't want to get paid for private pay, DHS, but it's legal. Stark has a bunch of basic landmines. It is, I don't want to say everything has to be in writing because that is an overstatement, but it's way better to have everything in writing including amendments and stuff gets screwed up all the time because it isn't in writing because of the importance of writing i think it is foolish to not use auto renewal terms in any agreement that's covered by stark because it's too easy to accidentally fail to renew the contract and then you have to pay us to fix a problem this is just a quick comparison big picture between stark and anti-kickback this is maybe more of a lawyer's chart but if you want to know the difference, Stark is civil, anti-kickback is criminal. The penalties under Stark are $15,000 a claim as opposed to going to jail under anti-kickback. Anti-kickback, the only thing that matters is intent. Is intent. Stark, we don't give a rip about intent. Which means that under the anti-kickback statu statute, you don't have to fit within a safe harbor. Stark, you have to meet an exception. Anti-kickback, 
doesn't apply to anything within a corporation. That's really clear. Payments in an entity aren't covered. Stark applies both in and outside of an entity. Um, Anti-kickback applies to everything paid for by a federal health care program, although almost every state extends the law to private payers. Stark only applies to Medicare and Medicaid, but many states have an extension, and you can get advisory opinions under either one. Also out there are tax exemption issues. The good news is that tax exemption analysis is often very similar to the analysis that you're going to do under the anti-kickback statute or Stark. The terms are a little bit different. We create words to make things, you know, that's lawyers need to, to freeze other people out. So we talk about private inurement or private benefit, which are fancy ways of saying someone is getting more money than they should from a tax exempt organization. So if you think about it, a payment that's at fair market value shouldn't have generally a private inurement or private benefit issue. Um, so there's a separate set of penalties that let the IRS take money back, but generally the analysis is going to be similar. The kinds of places this comes up are when doctors are medical directors or you get co-marketing between a doctor and a device company and things like that. And I'm just going to whip through a few examples. We have a webinar on this one too. Um, but here's a very important thing, make sure you know if you've got doctors in your organization, make sure you know what those doctors are doing. Ask them to disclose financial relationships. Um, if you have not, actually, if you have any healthcare professional and they're ordering stuff, you want to know what financial relationships they have. It's a good thing to ask as part of your compliance thing, and I'd ask it in writing. Another thing to keep in mind is that when someone's coming to sell you something, the person who's selling you has an incentive to characterize things as okay, and they will occasionally exaggerate the legality of an activity. I'm going to whip through a few examples of things here, right? So let's say someone is encouraging you as a physician to promote the off-label use of a device or a drug. Um, it's important to understand the difference between using something off-label. Doctors can use things off-label. Before aspirin was labeled to help uh, prevent heart disease, doctors could say, take an aspirin. That's legal, all right? You can't get paid to promote an off-label use. So if a d drug or device company comes in and says, doctor, we're going to pay you to give a speech to talk about how good this off-label use is, that's problematic. So off-label use, okay. Off-label promotion, problematic. So let's say a device c rep comes in and says, hey, we want your advice, physician. We'll pay you 200 bucks an hour if you'll come listen to this focus group. So if you want to go through that, you'd have to think about the different laws. You got to think about Stark, the anti-kickback analysis and the like, and how we're going to do this, right? So let's think about Stark. Well, Stark doesn't apply to vice companies. We're not going to worry about it very much. Um, anti-kickback. Well, might there be a kickback issue here? I think the answer is yes. So then you have to think about it. What advice is being paid for. Where are you doing it? Like if this is a meeting in San Diego, I'm more worried about it than if it's a meeting that's in Ottumwa, Iowa, um, where I last was on the day of the eclipse. Um, you, you're going to have to keep asking the questions of why. If the doctor is getting paid to attend half-day meetings and then sh uh, she's free to go tour Napa Valley wine country, um, which is a sadder thing to say today, um, that's, that feels different to me than if they're staying at the uh, airport um, courtyard by Marriott, right? So all of that stuff goes into the hopper. Um, the tax, is, tax exemption, we don't have to worry about here. And then, have I mentioned state law? So now, as many of you know, I'm a storm chaser. My son actually took this picture uh, as we went out on a chase. And if you're into this, this was a really cool storm. That little lowering there is actually a wall cloud. It, it, I was expecting the storm to drop a tornado. It never did. Just like here, often you have to figure out what's going on in the storm. So here's a line I've heard uttered a fair amount. It's not a conflict if I disclose it. And first, I want to say disclosure makes me feel a lot better about things, but it is not a complete cure. So the reason I think disclosure is better is I think that a, a practically a kickback case requires deception. And if there's no one who's lying, it's going to be really hard to make the case. And so when you've publicly described what's up, it's just going to be easier. But here's an example of how it isn't perfect. Doctor owns a company that's providing something to a hospital on a per-use basis. The doctor owns it. And the doctor says, we tell every patient, so this is okay. 
Well, there can still be Stark issues here. Disclosure alone isn't going to fix that. And so disclosure is helpful, but not a safety valve. Last uh, two examples, or three examples here. So this is an example of how wording matters. So let's say that an orthopedic physician and a family practitioner are friends. They go out for dinner to celebrate the ortho, I'm sorry, the family practitioner's birthday, and the orthopod buys, and the total book bill is 350 bucks. Is that a problem? I'm not super stressed out about that, assuming that they're friends. I, you know, I'm not super stressed out about it. It's probably okay. It's not clear, but I'm not going to lie awake nights. Let's make the bill go down to 100 bucks, but the physician submits the receipt to his clinic as a promotional expense. I feel a lot less good about it now because it now I worry that it's really you were giving something of value to the person to encourage referrals, whereas before it was friends going out for, for dinner. How you word stuff matters. Um, don't charge him. He's a good referral source. Is enough, arguably, to make a felony. The very f first, I think, project I ever worked on for a client in Iowa, I was a very baby lawyer, was a drug company that said, hey, if you prescribe this drug 10 times, we'll give you this light box that's used in the dermatology setting. And their, quote, legal department, and that's the letter was offered by the, quote, legal department, not a person, the whole department, says, well, this is fine because you're helping patients and therefore it's not a kickback. So my client said, I don't trust this letter from the legal department, and their lack of trust was well-placed. Um, don't rely on someone else's legal advice. It's helpful to get it. If someone's telling you something is okay or illegal, always ask them to to show you the rule. Get the advice, right? It's going to make it a lot cheaper when you call me or your other lawyer to ask for something. But the fact that something is helping a patient does not mean it's legal. The real question is, is there money being offered to the doctor in exchange for referrals? And here there arguably is, and I was worried about this deal. So the fact that it helps patient care is a myth, really. And if you think about it, what's the difference between $500 in cash or $500 in medical equipment? It's worth $500. So what you get doesn't matter. It's the, you know, m convert it to dollar value. Whatever the dollar, whether it's in cash or in kind is irrelevant. Last one on here. This is a thing which I often think makes people nervous. They'll say, a device manufacturer says, if you buy 10 of them, they're, they're $1,000 each. But if you go to 100 each, there's a volume discount. Um, they're yours for 100 bucks, and every one after that, you get a $100 rebate. And people often think this sounds illegal because it's got variable pricing, and that sounds fishy. I don't think it's fishy. Um, unless you're paid, first of all, if, if you're paid on a cost basis, you're going to have to disclose the fact that you have a discount, okay? But if you're not paid on a cost basis, if you and many of our listeners are not, um, then you can acquire things at different prices and markup is not a problem. Markup is generally okay in the healthcare world. So it's only a problem when you submit a cost report and you have not accurately disclosed the rebate. Now onto something totally different. And you may notice we're, we're up to 10 to, we're gonna get pretty close to, I may, I may run five or seven minutes over, but we'll be close to done on time here because we'll go pretty quick. I remember the first time I heard about the incident two billing rule and how I did not understand what it meant. And I thought that the TO was really the number two um, and I couldn't understand what it was. Part of this is once again, the wording. So the phrase means services that are an incidental part of the physician's services can be billed by a physician. Now, important Medicare concept because whose name goes on a claim matters. And a doctor's name can go on a claim for services provided by a non-physician if the following things are true. So the physician, in this case the clinic, and it's really the clinic for the, we'll talk about in a moment, pays for the expenses of the ancillary person. The clinic is providing the medical direction. And then this is a biggie, and this is misunderstood. The first visit for the course of treatment is with the physician. So the physician initiate, initiates the course of treatment. Later visits can be with the non-physician. Um, people often say that new problems can't be done incident to. That's not what the policy says. And this is an important one to understand. There's regulation, which is pretty non-detailed, and then there's CMS policy in the Medicare Claims Processing Manual. 
The Medicare Claims Processing Manual talks about a course of treatment. If you are getting chemotherapy, and in the middle of the chemotherapy, you get an infection, I would say that that is a new problem. The infection is new. It is not a new course of treatment. And so I am quite confident that a nurse practitioner or physician assistant can see the patient and bill under the doctor incident two, despite the fact that it's a new problem. And I know there are lots of people who will disagree with me, and I would ask those people who disagree with me to show me the support, because I am pointing to the course of treatment language. This has to be something that's typically done in an office, and then this is a weird one. It first came up, I don't know, 15 years ago, um, but the service has to be, actually I guess it's more like 20 years ago, has to be in, it can't be in a hospital or a nursing home, in a facility. In a facility, you can do shared visits, but not incident two. I'll come back to shared visits in a moment. So when you're in a hospital outpatient setting, no incident two. A physician has to be in the office suite when the service is provided, and the service should be billed under the name and number of the doctor who's in the suite. Um, a shared visit means that the doctor and the physician extender both see the patient on the same day, and the physician has to do something. Um, there is some language in some manuals that's really confusing, but suggests that they have to do some component of the E&M service, the history, exam, or medical decision-making. That isn't crystal clear, it's, but it's definitely the safe way to go. But like a nurse practitioner sees the patient in the morning, the doctor pops in in the evening and just does a quick exam or asks them how they're doing, you can combine their two notes into one visit, and that's a shared visit. Different from incident two, incident two, the doctor doesn't need to see the patient on the same day. They just have to, there has to be a doctor in the suite, and the claim goes in under a doctor who's physically present in the suite when the service happens. Okay, another kind of Medicare 101 principle is the idea of fee splitting. Fee splitting is kind of a close cousin of the anti-kickback statute, and it's the idea that a doctor is not supposed to share revenue um, with other people, um, whether they be a physician or a non-physician, in exchange for referrals. They can only trade the money on the basis of work performed. So you can't pay a kickback. You can't say, thanks for the referral, here's $20. That's usually in ethical rules for the doctors. It's also in state law a lot. And interpretations here can create weird things, like Florida interprets the fee-spitting law as saying a doctor can't enter into a management agreement with a company that pays the management company on a percentage of cases, or a percentage of receipts. I don't agree with the rationale in those cases, but you need to know that's what Florida does. Um, I haven't read other state states doing that, but it's out there. The corporate practice of medicine is an idea that's becoming, it, it, it's important when you've got companies trying to provide health care. Purely state-driven, and it basically says that a physician is not supposed to take direction from a non-physician. Most states have something that will say that either the doctor has to be in a professional corporation um, or something like that, and a non-professional corporation can't own a doctor. Um, in some states, they can't employ a doctor. Um, it may prevent a company from employing a doctor. So when you see, like, a, a, a clinic that set up a, a minute clinic or, you know, some, something going on a, in a CVS um, or in a Target, um, those kinds of entities, usually the doctor owns the company and then has a man relationship with the management company, and the management company manages the practice, but the physician is responsible for running the business. It's a sort of confusing, very legalistic principle, and it's just something you need to know about. Um, if you're doing a deal with any kind of for-profit company, you want to talk to someone who understands the corporate practice of medicine. The two midnight rule. I have a boatload of slides about that. I am not going to go through them all. You can read them. I'm just going to explain this concept very simply. If a doctor believes that a patient, it's medically necessary for a patient to be in the hospital over two midnights, that patient can and should be admitted as an inpatient to the hospital. It's really that simple. And I put a bunch of stuff here that you can read, but the only thing that matters is the expectation of the physician. And so, for example, if the person has been in one night and it's 11 p.m. on the second night, that doctor expects they're going to be in for two midnights unless the person's uh, dressed and walking out the door. 
and they can be admitted as an inpatient at that point and should be admitted as an inpatient. Whether they actually stay does not matter. It's expectation, not length of time. Um, it's got to be someone who has admitting privileges and who's knowledgeable about the patient's course of conduct. They can't delegate it to someone who's not authorized by state law to do things. Um, and the order has to be furnished at or before the time of admission. And so that is in the rule, so that's just something to note. Um, here's the language. I'm skipping through that because you can read through this on your own. I do want to mention, because this is something that's easy to miss, that the doctor has to acknowledge in writing um, that says that they've got a signed thing on file that says what's on this slide. And I'm skipping through this. This is just something to check. Make sure your hospital, if you're in a hospital, has this certification statement. All right, um, that's the two midnight rule. I do want to segue to something which is not valid today, but in the Health Law 101, this is a really important lesson to understand how to not get sold a bill of goods by someone who purports to be an expert. In the old days, people used to tell hospitals that they needed to, um, to use either Interqual or Milliman to figure out whether a patient was an inpatient, that they should use these tools to figure out whether the patient's um, severity of illness and intensity of services supported an inpatient admission. That is not what the manuals said. The manuals actually said, generally a patient is considered an inpatient if formally admitted with the expectation he or she will remain at least overnight. In other words, if you thought, expected that you'd be in overnight, that was enough. All right. There was then this confusing follow-up sentence. Physicians should use 24 hours as a benchmark. They should order admission for people who are expected to need hospital care for 24 hours or more. That was followed by the decision is complex and should be made only after the physician has considered a number of factors. Now, I would say that there are three standards articulated here. Overnight, 24 hours, and it's difficult. Overnight and 24 hours are the same only in Alaska during the winter north of the international date line. You'll see here there's no mention of interqual or milliman. There's no mention of, inter of uh, severity of illness or intensity of service. We got down a rabbit hole created by a bunch of people who weren't paying attention to what the government actually said. And my lesson here is you got to pay attention to what the government actually says. This is part of the make people show you the rule. And just because a million people think something is true doesn't mean it really is. All right, we're in the home stretch. Um, you know what? I've got three questions here. I'm going to answer those before I get into the home stretch here. Um, we struggle with determining what should be considered an overpayment. You indicated a missing signature doesn't mean an overpayment. Is there a good rule of thumb to follow to make that decision? And the short answer I would say is no, there isn't a rule of thumb. I would say this, call, this is one call, call us, right? We can talk in a, in a 10 minute phone call, we can often figure this out. And a 10 minute phone call is gonna cost you something like 30 to $50, right? Depending on who you call here. We can help you figure out whether something is an overpayment or not in that phone call. And that's usually the easiest way to do it. Because, I mean, I'm not talking that this is a big, big, big research project. It's very fact-specific. If you've done the work, then unless someone can point to a specific rule that says you don't get paid, I'm generally going to think it's not an overpayment. Um, how do most organizations deploy the certificate of concern email to a general population or to select populations? Um, I would do it as part of your compliance process. And I would, ideally, you're talking to people periodically. If you're big enough, you may have to do it as part of an email. But I would do it as part of an email with discussion. I, I don't like email, generally. I like to talk to people. And I think effective compliance requires some in-person training, and I would do it as part of that. All right, we're in the home stretch here. I'll run over by a couple of minutes, and I understand if people need to sign off, you can always catch the tail end um, uh, uh, online when it goes up next week. I will just say also for people who are begging off, please, fill, if, if you have a topic you think you want us to cover, do that, and please fill out the evaluation. All right, so... Bundled billing. You know, we've talked a little bit about this. There are lots of bundles out there, the biggie, the DRGs. And don't forget about the 72-hour rule, which is a principle that diagnostic services and some therapeutic services 
that are done in the three days before an admission to a hospital get bundled into the hospital stay. It's kind of crazy, but if I had a car accident and broke my arm on Monday, and Tuesday I had chest pain and go into the hospital for a heart attack, that x-ray bundles into my hospital stay. A little counterintuitive, but the real world. Um, in, uh, AS, or, uh, in the outpatient world, we've got APCs, which are ambulatory payment classifications, which is the bundled payment for hospital outpatient work. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is, a, is a, an idea which is pretty common out there and is confusing. It's the professional services arrangement. And I just want to explain what it is because it's something that often confuses people. And it's the idea that a clinic is going to contract with a hospital. I suppose it could, it, it could be other things too. Clinics could do it with another clinic, right? But it's often a clinic contracting with a hospital or another clinic to provide services and the hospital is going to bill for the services done by the clinic. That's usually done to take advantage of the fact that hospitals get higher reimbursement for their outpatient services. Now that's changing quite a bit. Um, you have to qualify as an outpatient uh, um, department in order to do this. Three of my colleagues did a marvelous webinar in April of 2016. Um, Briar Andreessen, Steve Beck, and Katie Ilton. It was really good. I learned a ton. You can watch that if you want to learn more about this. Um, and, uh, you know, this gets really complicated because, for example, we're trying to make it more difficult to have outpatient provider-based stuff. As of January 1st, you can no longer set up a new off-campus provider-based department. You can do it on campus, but you can't do it off-campus, which is more than 250 yards away from your main hospital. Um, so that's kind of confusing and complicated. Um, and you got to meet the provider-based requirements. And I'm just going to, I think I'm going to bring this home here because they did such a good job on that webinar. Um, and I will just end it here and say, if you've got any questions, and I think I see one more, um, I will close by noting, uh, you can, uh, that our next webinar is, I got to check the date here again, November 8th. It will be Briar, Katie, and Margie talking about HIPAA. Um, and the last question is on the Incident 2 slide. Can you clarify your statement that Incident 2 is not appropriate if the service is in a hospital? Does this include clinic, emergency, and observation services? Per the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, Chapter 5, it says outpatient therapeutic services can be billed Incident 2 a physician service. This, uh, what a great question. And this is why things are so confusing. Um, Oddly, some of these outpatient hospital services have to be incident to, but they're incident to and under the hospital's facility bill, which is different from under the physician's professional bill. Wow, this is really confusing. But so it is incident to for the hospital, but that doesn't mean that the doctor can bill for the stuff done by that physician extender. And hopefully... I'm explaining that clearly. If not, you can give me a call. But basically, in the hospital, the doctor has to either has to see the patient and has to qualify for a shared visit, or you're only going to be able to bill for what the doctor does him or herself. Um, and this is a place where the semantics are really confusing. And so the phrase incident two comes up, A, that phrase is confusing, and then B, the facility fee is billed as incident two. And so you've got a facility fee and a professional fee. Incident two applies to one differently than the other. So hopefully I didn't muddle that. Thanks guys for signing up. You can always email any of us with questions at any point. Um, as I said, we, we'd certainly love to help you on any legal or compliance questions. So call any of my colleagues or I anytime.